I'm going to show you another example. World War II ship defenses. As our ships sailed around the open ocean, they're vulnerable to four different kinds of attack. The first is shells from other ships. The second is bombs from aircraft. The third is torpedoes from submarines. And the fourth is mines. And as they sailed around in the sea, we started measuring how much damage was being done to our planes from each one of these different, done to our ships from each one of these different uh, weapon types. And we found that there was a certain damage in the form of casualties, human loss of life under one of these attacks, and a certain amount of damage where the ship would have to go into a repair bay and be fixed up before it could go back on a mission again. And as they studied these numbers, they said the numbers are all pretty healthy, but if you look at the damage due to shells and the damage due to mines, it's minimal compared to the other two. So we're going to focus on the other two. And we want to find a way to reduce the number of months that we spend in a repair bay when we get hit by bombs from aircraft and torpedoes from submarines. How are we going to do that? So they started looking at the effects. Well, what, what's causing this damage? Well, the torpedo was pretty obvious. It rams into the side of the ship and makes a hole. Hole fills with water. Uh, to the level you're able to contain it, you have to sail back and then and get that all pumped out and, and get your ship fixed. That's pretty obvious. The bombs weren't so obvious. At first, they thought that the damage due to the bombs was from them impacting on the deck and killing people and knocking holes in the, in the deck. Not true. The highest damage from a bomb was caused when the bomb missed the ship. When the bomb hit on the water line and exploded on the water line, it caused a hole in the side of the ship just like a torpedo. And they said, that's what we need to address. So they put their money into additional underwater armor and that foiled both the bombs and the torpedoes and cut back on the number of months that we spend in a repair bay. Now the second thing they did was train crews to fight decks that occur on the bridge or on the deck when the bombs do hit or when the naval shells do hit. That was their secondary effect. But they didn't know at the time when they first started what was the most effective way to spend their money in protecting ships. And that's what they arrived at. One last example. During the war, according to our measurements, American pilots' lethality against Japanese pilots was 10 to 1. We would kill their pilots 10 times more often than they killed ours. And we're very eager to understand why is this? Uh, what makes our pilots or aircraft so much more lethal than theirs? And we found two causes. The first was pilot training. If you could keep a pilot alive from his first mission to his sixth mission, after that, he would kill three times as many enemy aircraft as would be kill as he would until he would be killed. So on average, he would get three kills and then he would die. That's the average. That's not really how it happens. You know, once you die, you don't get to play again. Uh, the second effect was our planes were faster than theirs, and our planes could achieve three times, the faster planes could achieve three times the kill ratio of the slower planes. And that's what it accounted for most of the 10 to 1 kill ratio. So what do we do? We put more money into the speed of our planes and more money into the training of our pilots. That's what they learned in this operations research study. The, the three studies I just showed you come from a book called Methods of Operations Research written in 1950 by Morrison Kimball, who were actually inventing the science of operations research at that time. It's a fascinating book. If you want to read it, you'll find dozens of stories just like that on topics like these. Really interesting descriptions of how operations research is applicable to warfare situations. Well, we've invented operations research now. It's time to invent something else. John von Neumann helped build the atomic bomb. He helped design the earliest computers. He also invented a thing called games theory. In 1943, he said there should be a way to define decision making in a mathematical form so that you can maximize your desired outcome. More than just a seat of the pants guess about what you should do, but a quanti quantifying the possible outcomes of a situation and picking the outcome that's best for you. Now here's a simple example of the application of game theory. Imagine that you're a country that owns two different oil fields. One of them is 30 acres, the other is 24 acres. And you have a modest army. 
Your neighbor decides he wants your oil fields, and he's going to march against one of your oil fields. And your army is strong enough only to face him as an entire whole. So they've all got to go to one field or the other. You look at the situation and say, what should I do? What should I do? Well, one of the things you can do is define all of the possible outcomes. And the possible outcomes from the blue perspective are that you can end up with 39 acres of controlled oil field, or 30, or 24, or 42. Well, how do you arrive at those numbers? If your blue force goes and, and protects oil field A, he will own all of that acreage. But oil field B will be unprotected. If the enemy shows up at oil field A, he will fight you until he controls half of that oil field. So you will own oil field B, 24 acres, which nobody's challenged you for, and half of oil field A, 39 acres total. When you look at all the different combinations of who's attacking and who's defending which oil field, you'll find out that those are the four outcomes. And you'll look at that, and from the defender's point of view, the blue point of view, you'll say, obviously, what I want to happen is I want to meet him at oil field B A or at oil field B. That's what happens best for me. The worst thing that can happen for me is for me to defend the wrong oil field and he gets all of one of them. That's the worst thing. So, if you think you're the only logical person on the battlefield, you march off and defend oil field A. And you wait for him to show up and attack you. However, if the red side is also a, of a scientific mind, he'll draw his own matrix and he'll say, you know, the best thing for me is to go where he's not going to be. I don't want to get into a battle with him. I want to take all of either oil field. So you're thinking exactly opposite of the defender. Now you go into the, well, I think he's going to. Well, no, I think you're going to. But then he'll know that I did this. But then I'll know that he does this. And at some point, you have to decide, what is he going to do? And you choose your decision based on what he's going to do. That's what game theory is. The example I just showed you is a very simple example. It's a simple example known as general two-person zero-sum game. That means there's two players, and for every acre lost by me, it's gained by you. Nothing falls through the cracks. There are other forms of game theory known as utility theory, two-person non-zero-sum games, and in-person games, which bring in the idea of cooperation. And by cooperating, two forces may be able to accomplish more than if they fought together. That was the birth of game theory, right around 1943. A friend of uh, John von Neumann's was Stanislaw Ulam. He also worked on the nuclear weapons at the Manhattan Project. And apparently he got bored around 1949 and started thinking up a new theory. And his theory was called the Monte Carlo method. In the conduct of analysis on the Manhattan Project, they were in the practice of building very exact mathematical equations of the behavior of atomic particles, of phys physical phenomena. And they were always searching for an algorithm that described exactly what did happen. Well, along the way, after these guys emerged, they said, perhaps there are some behaviors which are so difficult to characterize mathematically that there'd be a better way to approach the problem. Perhaps we could describe them statistically. We could say that on this particular engagement or this particular event, I don't know exactly how it's going to come out, but I know statistically over multiple runs what that curve is going to look like. So if I could find out what that statistical distribution is, I could run a simulation and randomly select one outcome, run it again and again and again, run it multiple times, and the behavior of all of these statistical distributions interacting with each other would shake out the behavior of the whole system. And so they found a way to use random numbers and statistical distributions in place of exact mathematical algorithms for every decision. That's Monte Carlo theory. Well, Stanislaw Ulam rushed over and told John von Neumann, who being a great entrepreneur, said, that's a brilliant idea. And not only am I brilliant, but I can sell stuff. And he went out and explained this again and again to the military until he got a lot of the credit for inventing it. But he's the one that popularized Monte Carlo theory for studying military phenomena and physical phenomena. 
I'm going to show you one more algorithm. It's called the Lagrange multiplier method. If somebody gives you an equation and says, I want you to maximize this equation, like that oil field, maximize the number of uh, acres you'll control, maximize the attrition against the enemy, maximize your, your fuel efficiency. I want you to maximize this thing. And all I can tell you is a few of the conditions which must be imposed on this. You know, your tank, fuel tanks are only so big. Uh, you only have so many forces to divide into three different battlefields, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Your method of solving that problem can be one of three. The first is to guess, to say, ah, see to the pants, I think this is the best decision. The second is for you to run through every combination of variables until you find the one that maximizes the equation. That one might take a long time. And the third is to use techniques like the Lagrange multiplier method. And one example of that would be a simple mathematical equation. Maximize x times y given that x plus y minus 10, or x plus y has to equal 10. Now some of you have already taken a math class and you go, I know what the answer is already. We did this in math class. Well, the Lagrange multiplier method says the first thing you do is create a Lagrange function. A Lagrange function is simple. It's just one function plus the Lagrange multiplier times the other function. That's simple. Then you take the partial derivatives of those with respect to x, y, and l. And now what have you got? You have three equations in three unknowns. Oh, a little bit of linear algebra, and you find out that x is 5 and y is 5. So the optimum answer is x is 5, y is 5, the sum is 25. Uh, no other number, the product is 25. No other number works. Uh, that's what the Lagrange multiplier method is. Well, these methods that I've just been through uh, were really being studied and shaken out and applied at Rand Corporation. Around 1945, the Air Force created a project they called Project Air Force. And eventually that evolved into the FFRDC known as the Rand Corporation. And the Rand Corporation were the pioneers in systems analysis. They applied Lagrange multiplier methods, random number generators, Monte Carlo theory, game theory, all of these different ways of looking at combat. They studied it, primarily as it can be applied to nuclear weapons, but later as it can be applied to all kinds of military and sociological phenomena. <coughs>